Well, good morning, everyone. And a uh, really uh, warm welcome on this uh, cold October morning uh, to Great Victoria Street Baptist Church uh, this morning. As we mentioned on the front of our bulletin, we want to be a church that opens wide our doors to everyone in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so if you're here this morning, whether you're a regular or you're just visiting us this morning, we want you to feel really, really welcome amongst us. And we are really, really glad that you've been able to join us. Uh, Let me just mention a few things coming up in the life of the church. Hopefully you got a bulletin as you were coming in that has everything there. Please do take a look uh, through that later on. Uh, Tonight, we're back meeting at 6.30 for our continued series through Ezra, Nehemiah. We move into the book of Nehemiah tonight and a real encouragement for us to pray that the Lord is one who hears and answers prayer. So just encourage you to come back uh, this evening for that. Uh, Thursday night, uh, Thursday morning, sorry, we have our Tots and Tinies gathering. So if you've got a little one or you know someone who does and you want to invite them along, be great. Please do uh, come on Thursday morning. Next Sunday, we have our Mission Focus Sunday. So we're really looking forward to this. You know, Connor Johnson and the rest of the missionary committee have been working really hard putting this together. Um, Michael Emadi coming uh, from, uh, he's the pastor of Dundalk Baptist. He's going to be coming to help us think through what does it look like for us to reach the nation of Ireland uh, with the gospel, and particularly those uh, coming from a Catholic background. And we're going to have a a lunch all together after the morning service. So do bring some food with you. There'll be some uh, tea and tray bakes served for that too. So do come prepared for that if you're able to. We'd really encourage you to prioritize sticking around during that lunchtime too as we just continue to think that through um, and hear from Michael couple other things, just a light party I'm going to mention. Uh, Jenny was up here sharing about this uh, last week. Loads of ways that uh, we need help with this, whether it's delivering some flyers, whether it's helping on the day, whether it's providing a set of lights to light the room up. Uh, have a look there. There's a little box in the, in the bulletin about how you can help out. So do um, have a look. That's on Monday, the 28th of October. And then a reminder too about shoe boxes. If you've brought things, please do put those into the box there. Or if you haven't, Uh, bring them back uh, tonight too. The children are going to be beginning to pack those uh, next Sunday. So that's great. Last uh, announcement we have is from our church secretary, uh, Joanne, who is going to come and talk about Wednesday evening. Good morning, everyone. Uh, This is a notice for all church members. An ordinary church business meeting will be held this Wednesday, the 16th of October, to hear reports on the ongoing and planned work of the church and to receive an update on the church's financial position. Uh, Members can collect copies of the draft minutes of all church meetings held since the 20th of March this year and the agenda for the business meeting from the front of the church. Uh, The Ordinary Church Business Meeting will be followed by a short special uh, church business meeting to consider members of our issues of membership and the uh, service start times. Both meetings are open only to church members. Thank you. Please do come along on Wednesday if you're able to. Well, we have a uh, focus this morning on giving. And as we turn to our call to worship, I want us to focus our mind on the greatest gift that we have all received if we are trusting in the Lord Jesus this morning. Romans chapter 6 verse 23 says this, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. We have received the greatest gift in the Lord Jesus, as he came, as he paid that price that we could never pay on the cross, and as he gives us then eternal life. And we're going to respond by uh, singing these opening two songs, crown him with many crowns and before the throne of God above. Let's stand and worship our God together.
take a seat and let's just continue to worship the Lord as we turn to him in prayer together now let's pray our father in heaven hallowed be your name Lord God you are holy you are worthy of all worship and praise and we come and we recognize that this morning and we say together hallowed be your name May your name, Lord, be hallowed in this place, even as we gather as your people this morning. Would you help us to rightly praise, worship, and honor you? Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it, as it is in heaven. Lord, we long that your name would be hallowed right across this world that you have made. May your kingdom come. May more and more people come to rightly worship and honour you. And Lord, we ask that your will would be done amongst us here on earth, amongst us here as a church, amongst our lives individually. Lord, we pray that yes, we have our plans, but we know that your plans are far above ours. And we know that your plans are good for your people. And so we ask, Lord, that your will would be done in our lives. Give us today our daily bread. Lord, we come as deeply needy people this morning. Lord, we thank you for all of the ways that we can look back on our lives and just remember all of the good gifts that you have given us. And Lord, we come and we ask today for those things that we need, each of us. We pray for food and shelter 
And Lord, also those other needs of whatever is going on in our lives, we thank you that you know those things. We come and we bring our requests to you and we ask that you would please provide all that we need. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lord, just as we have come and we've confessed that we are needy people, we come and we confess again this morning that we are sinful people. Even this past week, we have not lived in honor and glory of you. Lord, we are sorry. We're sorrowful, Lord, for the ways that we have dishonored your name and the ways that we've hurt others around us this week. Lord, forgive us our sin. And we do that, we ask that looking to the Lord Jesus and remembering the forgiveness that we do find in him, that in him we have found forgiveness for all our trespasses, that in him he has canceled the record of debt that stood against us, that he has nailed it to the cross. And Lord, as we ask that you would forgive us our sins, Lord, move us out of a response of what we have received, the forgiveness we have received, to be ready to forgive those around us as well. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lord, we need your work in our lives. Lord, protect us from the flaming darts of the evil one. Help us to put on the full armor of God and Lord help us to walk in holiness and help us as we do that to point others to you and to your goodness as well for the kingdom the power and the glory are yours now and forever Lord we thank you that as we say those words we are not just saying words but we are saying something that is so true you Lord are glorious you are powerful your kingdom is forever We thank you that you are our God and we give you all the glory and all the honour this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, we are going to turn to our Bible reading uh, for this morning, which comes from uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and then a second reading just a little bit further on from chapter 9 and Sharon is going to come and read those for us. Thanks, Sharon. So, um, reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 9. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify and beyond their means of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favour of taking part in the relief of the saints. And this, not as we expected, but they gave themselves first to the Lord and then by the will of God to us. Accordingly, we urge Titus that as he had started, so he should complete among you this act of grace. But as you excel in everything, in faith, in speech, in knowledge, in all earnestness and in our love for you, See that you excel in this act of grace also. I say this not as a command, but to prove by the earnestness of others that your love also is genuine. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. And then on to 2 Corinthians chapter 9, from verses 6 to 15. The point is this. Whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make all grace abound to you, so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. As it is written, he has distributed freely, He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. He who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed for sowing and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way, which through us will produce thanksgiving to God. 
for the ministry of this service is not only supplying the needs of the saints, but is also overflowing in many thanksgivings to God. By their approval of this service, they will glorify God because of your submission that comes from your confession of the gospel of Christ and the generosity of your contribution for them and for all others, while they long for you and pray for you because of the surpassing grace of God upon you. Thanks be to God for this inexpressible gift. Amen. Thank you very much, Sharon. As I'm just looking out there, I'm seeing Glenn and Debbie Burton are here uh, this morning with little Mabel, I, I presume, too, back there. So it is great to be able to welcome her officially uh, to Great Vic and great to have you guys around. Please do go and uh, say hello uh, to them later on, too. Um, as most of you will know by now, we are in a two-month uh, focus on our redevelopment uh, building project. And so just as part of that this morning, I wanted to take just two or three minutes right now just to encourage us uh, all again about why we believe this project is so good. Why is this a project that we are pressing on with? If we're going to be people who are praying about this, who are going to be people who are talking to others about this project, if we're going to be people who are contributing, giving towards this, um, it's good for us all, I think, to be excited about what we are looking ahead to. Um, and so um, I, what I want to do this morning is just look at a few of these plans together and get us excited. I know that the architects, the building committee have been working really, really hard at this over so many months now. So just wanted to share a few of those things. I'm going to share five things for us to be excited about, uh, about why we believe this project is so good. First of all, as you look up there, this project puts our building back up on the street front. You can even picture there the people walking in front of this building. This Great Victoria Street is, is being renewed. There are more and more people coming in front of our doors, and this is a really exciting thing for us as we look to be this beacon uh, of hope and pointing people to the Lord Jesus in this city. Uh, and so that being back out on that street front is going to serve us so well. Just picture that witness there that we can have for many, many years to come. Then the second thing, that front area you can see there in that glass is that welcoming open uh, frontage to the building. Maybe you could click onto the next slide. That would be great. Thank you. You'll see here, um, hopefully on these plans, if you can, glance on that left-hand side, this open frontage kind of coffee bar welcoming area. And again, the idea here is this is just to invite people into the space. You can imagine, we can imagine going forward, a space for Hope Explored, perhaps, to happen. A space even on a Saturday afternoon as people come into shopping just to welcome them in, some kind of coffee outreach. There are so many opportunities there, and it will serve really well as we welcome people into our church too. That's the second thing, so the front foyer area. Third thing, simply the size of the sanctuary you can see there. 275 seats in that main area there, 100 plus in our gallery. On a Sunday, we are at capacity, particularly in the mornings. We are at capacity. We're often out the back there. And this is just going to serve us so well. Serve us being able to put on bigger events um, as well. So the size of the sanctuary there and the, the ease of a flow as well. There is much more space at the end of the service. We're not going to be crammed into our little space for coffee. We can talk and move around freely. Uh, fourth thing, and this is really something that we're suffering from at the moment, is the space for children and youth work. You'll see on this next slide here, um, there are... There are three uh, dedicated meeting rooms on the second floor. Uh, two of those at least are going to be dedicated to children's work. You can imagine the space. It says they're seating uh, 45, 65, 20 people. Look, imagine what our building space is at the moment. This is space that's dedicated, can be set up, left set up, to serve our children really, really well going forward. Um, on the third floor then, there is also this purpose-built youth lounge. Again, we're blessed at the moment that we are beginning this new youth ministry. And we just, as children continue to grow, would love to have a purpose-built space there. You can imagine table tennis, table uh, football, hanging out, just spending time. So again, a great space for us to use. And then the fifth thing that will serve us really well, and I guess this is what this was to the old church. I wasn't part of this. But another hall, another big um, hall there that is uh, serviced to uh, the main hall there that services uh, those, the kitchen is right beside it, big space, you can imagine, uh, can't you, the, the opportunities, we could put on some sports events, we could have a, uh, a 
a summer outreach that invites people into our building. Uh, again, and there will be so many opportunities just to get out into the community and then invite them. That is going to be a double height space. Just really, really exciting. And all of that, I've skipped over so many things. I could have mentioned disabled access, uh, a sensory room. We're going to still have car parking spaces, 26 of them right here where this building is. Uh, and there is loads, loads more. Go talk to somebody. If you know them on the building committee, go talk to them. See, hear what they're most excited about. Why this is going to serve us uh, really, really well. So as I said at the beginning, we really do, as we look at this project, believe that this would be such a good thing for us to be able to press on into as we just continue to be that light, we pray, uh, of the gospel here in this city. For, imagine, picture with me, another 100, another 150 years as that building uh, serves that purpose of facilitating just all that we look to do as a church. So hopefully that just whets your appetite a little bit for what's coming up. Let me just pray briefly once again for this project. Lord God, we do look at these plans and we thank you. We thank you for those who have drawn them up. We thank you for the hard work that has gone into this point. And Lord, we are excited about what could lie ahead here. Lord, we do believe that it would be so good for us to be able to press on with this plan and this project. And we place that into your hands. Lord, help us to be prayerful. Help us to give out of what we can. And Lord, please would you provide. And in your provision, Lord, would your name be lifted high and glorified in this place, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we are going to turn and sing again uh, two songs as looking to the Lord Jesus. We're going to sing Christ, our wisdom, and then Jesus, your name. Let's stand and worship our Lord and Saviour.
Well, do take a seat. And uh, children, it has been great to have you with us uh, up to this point in the service. Uh, but it's time now for you to make your way out to your various different groups. The older group, uh, P5 to 7 from the front here. Otherwise, those younger are in the creche age from the back. And as they make their way out, why don't we turn and just uh, say hello to somebody sat nearby. Well, do pick those conversations back up again. If you're able to, there's going to be uh, tea and coffee and refreshments served from the back and also from the front here at the end. So do pick those conversations back up. In just a moment, Steve's going to uh, come and bring God's word to us. But before that, Clifford, one of our elders, is going to come and lead us as we turn to the Lord and pray uh, for our world and our land and our church. Thanks, Clifford. Our Father, we have ready this morning in our prayer recognized who you are and offered you our praise and our worship. And we've also prayed for our church future. We now take an opportunity to pray for ourselves, those who are here this morning. And we think of uh, some, and many of us could name them, who through age or illness are struggling with loneliness or pain or discomfort or disillusionment, just wondering what the future holds. And we pray for them, they will have peace and good recovery. We think of those who are involved day to day in their, their daily work, which in many cases is very busy, very frantic, full of stresses and anxieties and difficulties. And we just pray that you would give them strength to cope. And may they always remember that the position that they are in you understand and are with them. And we think of those younger ones who are engaged in studying, either at school or university, or some training courses. We pray that you would give them good concentration, good discipline, help them to make good progress as they prepare for the next stages of their lives. And they, may they be assured that your plans for the next stages of their lives are perfect, and their studying at the moment is just the introductory part of that. And we pray for the very young children, some of them we have just seen leaving, and those even younger, the young babies. We pray that they would be learning good Christian values from their Sunday school teachers, and as they watch their parents. And for the very young ones, we just pray that you would keep them safe and strong and healthy. Help them to learn new words, learn language, and learn how to express themselves in good preparation for the years to come. And we pray that that preparation would help them in their education, but help them to recognize the reality of God, the truth of the gospel, and that they would come to trust and believe in you in their own time. Beyond the church, we are conscious of the fact that outside there is so much indifference, both in Belfast and other parts of the world, indifference to Christian values. But in many cases, it is more than just indifference. There's a very visible hostility towards God, towards Christ, towards the Bible, towards church, towards Christians. This annoys us and frustrates us and can make us anxious. But we pray that in your good time, you would dissolve that hostility, especially in the hearts and the lives of those in other countries involved in conflict, 
where they've got some form of influence. We pray that that hostility would disappear and that many people will come to recognize and see what to us is absolutely obvious. God is real and God has a purpose and God is love and God is meaningful and wishes to be involved in people's lives. Thank you for Steve and Simon and the work that they do. Thank you for Steve's preparation for this morning. He has spent a long, a long time preparing a sermon. Help him, Lord, to remember clearly the things which he has thought about. And we pray that you would help us. Help us not just to be interested in the sermon, though we do ask for that, but also that your truths would be evident in our hearts as we listen, so that we would be responsive. And we pray that as a result of meeting this morning, tomorrow and the days that follow, that we would honor you in all that we say, all that we do, and all that we think. And we pray this for Jesus' sake. Amen. 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 Thank you, Clifford, for praying for us. Well, good morning, everyone. It's nice to be able to add to the, the welcome Simon gave at the start of the service. If you have your Bible, please open with me to the passage Sharon read for us earlier, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. I'm going to be moving around in different parts of the Bible this morning, um, but certainly that is the anchor text that everything is drawn on. Just to give you a sense of, of where we're going from this morning, um, last week and this morning, uh, sermons focusing on our uh, effort uh, behind our building project. Next week, we've got our Mission Sunday with Michael Amadi coming, and then from the Sunday after that, we are back into the book of Revelation, picking up at chapter 12, and I am very eager to get back into that book with you as we go from 12 right through uh, to the end of the book, and I really hope that will be helpful. But this morning, we're going to think of the gospel-shaped nature of Christian giving, financial giving to the work of the Lord. And I want to begin by saying this, if giving of your financial resources to the work of the Lord is not a significant part of your Christian life, you are really missing out on something, something that can bring great blessing and joy to your life. In Acts chapter 20, verse 35, the Apostle Paul recounts something that Jesus said when he was teaching on giving. Paul says, we must remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Are you experiencing the goodness of the blessing that comes with giving to God's work in the world? This morning's message is entitled, Gospel-Shaped Giving, and it is designed to help us understand how giving is a God-like and gospel-shaped activity that can bring great joy and blessing into our lives. Last week, as I mentioned, we launched a special two-month focus through the months of October and November where we're really seeking the Lord for the resources needed for our building project. I shared last week that our architects have now given us a pathway to commencing that work on the site, um, projecting June, July next year. But I also shared that to press forward on that timeline, we really need to close our outstanding funding gap. We need to see basically one million come in by the end of this year for us to progress according to the timeline that the architects have laid out for us. And so last week, I shared some encouragements from the book of Haggai to help stir us up so that each of us will feel the desire to own this work and play our part in the project. And it has been so immensely encouraging this week to get different messages and conversations and encouragements from 
you speaking of how you want to get involved in this, from a quiz being put on to raise funds to others doing lots of different things and people thinking very carefully about how they can sacrificially give. It is super exciting. And so with all of that in mind, I thought this week it might be really helpful to have a general sermon on what the Bible teaches about giving of our finances to the Lord so that we can make sure together we're approaching this whole task and our thinking about giving in a biblically informed way. I don't want any of us to be assuming anything here, but instead just revisiting the foundations of the Bible's teaching on giving so that we're, we're positioned to think well about this. So I'm hoping this sermon will stand like a wonderful invitation from Jesus for you to experience what he meant when he spoke of the blessedness of giving, now and throughout your life. So I don't want this just to apply to our building project. I want these foundations to build something into your life that will exist now. And if you ever move on from Great Vic to somewhere else, it's going to build foundations in your life to think about giving in a biblical way. So what I want to do is just give you three foundational truths on the Bible's teaching on giving, and then some practical implications that flow out from that. Foundational truth number one. Our God is a giving God. Now, it might sound pretty obvious or not that profound, but it really is profound when you slow down and just think about it. The nature of God, a giving God. God is clearly revealed in Scripture as a benevolent, gracious giver. Think of it. In the beginning, Genesis 1, God is the one who gives existence to everything that exists. He gives light. He gives land. He gives water. He gives trees, animals, humanity. He gives all created things their existence. I was just thinking about this this morning in a discussion with Lindsay over the breakfast table. After the fall, God gave Adam and Eve a covering because their own covering was insufficient. So kind, so generous, giving them what they couldn't provide for themselves. Paul, when he was preaching in Athens in Acts 17, 25, said of God, he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. God is the one who has given you your existence. He's giving you life and breath in this moment. He has given you everything you have. Think about that. Think about that. God gives us our essentials, for example. Acts 14, 17, Paul, again preaching, says, He did you good by giving you rains from heaven and fruitful seasons satisfying your hearts with food and gladness. He also gives us more than just the essentials. 1 Timothy 6, 17, As for the rich in this present age, charge them not to be proud nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Here are some other wonderful things that God gives to his people in Scripture. Strength and peace. Psalm 29, 11, the Lord gives strength to his people. The Lord blesses his people with peace. Or Proverbs 2, 6, God gives wisdom, for the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. James 4, 6, God gives grace, but he gives more grace. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Or 1 Corinthians 3, 7, growth. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything but only God who gives the growth. So he gives us life, he gives us breath, he gives us everything, he gives us our essentials, he gives us our luxuries, he gives us strength and peace and wisdom and grace and growth. And so Paul concludes in 1 Corinthians 4, 7, what do you have? that you did not receive. 
And if you received it, why do you boast as if you did not receive it? You apply that. Why do you live your life as if you did not receive it all from God? So here's foundation one. God is a giving God. Foundation two. The gospel is a gospel of giving. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish, but have eternal life. God, because of His great love for the world and its lostness, out of a passion for His glory, gives His only Son to the world to save lost people from perishing in sin, so that he can give them, in Jesus, the gift of eternal life. God the Father in love gives his Son to the world to save them. In John 10, 27, Jesus speaks of himself giving his people eternal life. Jesus says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they will never perish and no one will snatch them out of my hand. The Father gave the Son to accomplish our salvation, but remember, He also gives the Holy Spirit to apply our salvation. 1 Thessalonians 4, 8, it is God, that is a reference to the Father, who gives His Holy Spirit to you. In John 6, 63, Jesus said, it is the Spirit who gives life. The Spirit is called in the Nicene Constantinople Creed, the Lord and the giver of life. I love that title for the Holy Spirit in that creed. The Spirit, the Lord and the giver of life. It's a beautiful summary. So the Father gives life through His giving of the Son. The Son gives life by His death on the cross, securing salvation. The Spirit gives life by applying all the accomplishments of Christ to our lives. Every person of the Godhead active in giving life to those who were dead in transgressions and sin. The gospel is a story of love-motivated giving. The Father gives the Son, and the Father and the Son give the Spirit to secure and apply eternal life. And so in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 9, if you look down, the text that the Apostle Paul uses to set up his whole teaching on giving in that section, it's a gospel-shaped text. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you by his poverty might become poor rich. And the Apostle Paul takes that gospel-centered truth, and then he builds all his teaching on giving, showing that it is a gospel-shaped thing to do. So, foundation one, God is a giving God. Foundation two, the gospel is a gospel that's all about giving. Foundation three, It should be no surprise to us, therefore, that God has called His people consistently in Scripture to be a giving people. Giving is a God-like and a gospel-shaped thing to do. And so it is no surprise that God has called His image bearers who are to reflect His likeness in the world to be a giving people. And this call is consistent across Scripture. And so what I want to do in the lion's share of, our, of this message is just to think, what does this giving call look like in the Old Testament? And then what does it look like in the New Testament? And how does that apply to us today? So thinking about giving in the Old Testament, there were two primary calls to give that God gave His people in the Old Testament. The first we see was in Exodus 25, the call for the people to give a one-off contribution for the construction work of the tabernacle, the place where God said He would dwell and meet with His people. So in Exodus 25, 1 and 2, for example, we read, the Lord said to Moses, 
speak to the people of Israel that they would take for me a contribution. So each person is to give something to the work of constructing the tabernacle. From every man whose heart moves him, you shall receive the contribution for me. And then you get quite a lot of information about the people bringing gold, silver, bronze, yarns of various colors, animal skins, precious stones, and all of that was used for this man Bezalel, who was also given gifts from the Holy Spirit so that the tabernacle could be constructed. That was the first primary call to give in the Old Testament. Then the second call to give was in the form of an ongoing kind of giving known as the tithe. The people were to give a tenth of their income to provide for the ongoing work and witness of the tabernacle and the servants, known as the Levites, who ministered there. So in Numbers chapter 18, for example, we read of God commanding the Israelites to bring a tenth of their income in the form of crops or animals or whatever they had. They were to bring it to the tabernacle, and that tenth would be used to support the Levites, the men who were given responsibility for overseeing that the tabernacle was in a good state of repair. They were to make sure that all the sacrifices were in order to serve the priests who were offering them on behalf of the people. All the people were to bring a tenth of their income to the tabernacle. The Levites would live off that tenth, and the tabernacle would be cared for through that tithe. So Numbers 18, 21, so you can see I'm not just making this up. God said to the Levites, I have given every tithe in Israel for an inheritance in return for their service that they do, their service in the tabernacle or the tent of meeting. So the tithe of the people was a way of supporting the covenantal religious system of the Old Testament. It was referred to in the book of Numbers and Deuteronomy as bringing a first fruits to the Lord. So the idea was you sort of set apart the first of your crops and the first of your animals and you brought them to the Lord as your worship offering. The idea was that God has provided His people with everything they enjoy. Everything they owned was ultimately God's and they were stewards his resources. God required his people in the Old Testament to give back a tithe, 10% of their income as an offering of worship, and they were to live off the other 90%. But here is the point I want to make. The giving of the people in the Old Testament was built into the covenantal system as, as a fundamental part of their worship. Giving is worship. Every act of giving was worship. When the people brought their offerings, they saw it as part of their worship. So, for example, in 1 Chronicles 16, 29, a prayer of David is recorded. He prays, ascribe to the Lord the glory due His name. Bring an offering and come before Him. Worship the Lord in the splendor of holiness. Every act of giving was worship. Now, when the people in the Old Testament got greedy and failed to trust God and abandoned the tithe, they thought, I'm not going to live off 90%. I'm going to live off 100%. God charged it against the people as sin. And listen to the language God uses in Malachi chapter 3, verse 8. Will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you in your tithes and your contributions? I remember a while ago buying, I'll not name them, one of our children a chocolate bar as a wee treat. And that chocolate bar had 10 pieces. I asked for one. I remember I was driving the car and said, can I have a bit of your chocolate? No, Daddy, it's mine. I just said, how did you get the bar? And I left it there. 
I did get a piece in the end. <laughs> we don't want to be like that. We don't want to be like that. It's mine. Moreover, in the book of Malachi, chapter 1, verse 13, God said the problem was not just that his people weren't bringing, but they actually were bringing out of a duty, but they were bringing the leftovers. Here's what we read in Malachi 1.13. God said, you bring what has been taken by violence or is lame or is sick, and this you bring as your offering. So the people were, were just sort of looking, at, right, there's a really sick sheep that's about to die. That'll be our offering. There's a blind sheep, not worth much. We'll fire that in. And God challenged the people because they were not giving their best, but they were giving the blind, the lame, and the sick that weren't worth much anyway. Their giving was an afterthought, and that was what God was challenging in the Old Testament in Malachi. They knew they had to give something to, the, to God. They had this sort of sense of obligation, well, we have to give something, so they brought the lame and the sick. What an insult to God that must have been. The insult of, imagine a hundred healthy sheep, and there's a lame one and a blind one. Pick them out and give them to God. Oh, we don't want to be like that. We do not want to be like that. We don't want to just live and then give the dregs and the leftovers of our resources. We want to be those that bring the first fruits, the best. So that's the system of giving in the Old Testament, that one-off giving for the construction of the tabernacle, the rebuilding of the temple that we see later in the Old Testament, and then the ongoing tithe. Of course, there were special offerings, special festival tithes on top of the tithes and all of that, but we don't need to get into that. The foundational call was a one-off gift in times of particular need and ongoing giving in the form of the tithe. Now, let's move into the New Testament. As we move into the New Testament, we recognize that as Christians, we are no longer under the Old Testament laws in the same way that the Israelites were under them in the Mosaic Covenant. All of those Old Testament laws funnel down and lead into Christ. They were fulfilled by Jesus, and they come through in a kind of refracted way. So I think of all the Old Testament, like, like an, a sidewards egg timer, all of the Old Testament laws funnel into Christ, and then they come out the other side, all adjusted, fulfilled, and apply in different ways in Christ. So we're no longer, for example, to bring a tithe to support this group of men known as the Levites as they look after the tabernacle or temple in Jerusalem. But certainly, the laws on giving in the Old Testament do seem to give us a clear framework for helping us to think about the call to give in the New Testament. So for example, in 1 Corinthians 9.13, the Apostle Paul alludes to the Old Testament system of supporting the Levites through the tithe and says in the church age, we should still support gospel ministers and missionaries financially so that they can continue in the work of the Lord. So Paul writes there, for example, and listen really carefully to how he thinks back to the system in the Old Testament and applies it to living in the church age. Do you not know that those who are employed in the temple service get their food from the temple, and those who serve at the altar share in the sacrificial offerings in the same way. The Lord commanded that those who proclaim the gospel should get their living by the gospel. 1 Timothy 5.18, Paul uses an Old Testament law saying, you shall not muzzle the ox as it treads out the grain. It's a great illustration. You know, the idea was, the ox was tramping over the grain um, so that it would separate the, the head from the stalk. And the cow wanted to eat it. But some people were putting a muzzle over the cow so that it wouldn't get to share in the benefit of what it was doing. And so this lovely Old Testament law that is so full of ethical guidance, don't muzzle the ox, let it enjoy the fruit of its labor. 
And Paul uses that as the illustration drawn from the Old Testament to say, you should pay your pastors. Free them up so that they can give themselves fully to the proclamation of the gospel. Support missionaries. Give to the work of the Lord. So, I'm the ox in that text, <laughs> which is really funny. <laughs> and you give so generously to facilitate me and Simon and our other staff members so that we can give ourselves to that work. It's a biblical, it's a good thing to do. But I think we can draw from these texts the conclusion that in a similar way as the Old Testament people of God were to bring an offering to support the covenantal ministry at the temple, so those who are part of the, the church of Jesus Christ in the New Testament should bring an offering to support the covenantal ministry of the church. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus didn't say, if you pray, if you give. He said, when you pray, when you give. When you give, give unto the Lord, not to be praised by man. So Jesus certainly assumed that giving would be a normal part of every Christian's life. And let's sharpen our question slightly. Should that be a tithe, 10% of our income in the New Testament age, in the church age? Well, let's be really clear. The tithe is nowhere commanded in the New Testament. And I don't think that should surprise us at all. Because the New Testament doesn't typically give us such set commands like that, because in the New Testament, God is always, as he was in an incipient way in the Old Testament, God is always aiming to get down at what's going on in our hearts with respect to our giving in the New Covenant. And that was always the case. God challenged the people's hearts about their giving right throughout Scripture. But where there is a law on tithing in the Old Testament, the law doesn't seem to be sufficient, really, under the New Covenant age. Because in the New Covenant, we live out the, the commands in a written-on-the-heart kind of way. So, for example, the Pharisees were scrupulous in tithing, but they treated it like a tick box. They thought, right, tenth of my mint, tenth, tenth of my spices, tenth of this, we've checked the box. But their hearts were actually full of greed and injustice. And so Jesus challenged them in Matthew 23, 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe the mint and dill and cumin, but have neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice and mercy and faithfulness. And he says you should have done the latter. You should have done the earlier without neglecting the latter. So there's a hint again that Jesus has this understanding that the Old Testament tithe is in view. It's okay to do that. But make sure you never just think, I've brought 10%, tick, and I can be really selfish with the rest of my life. That's what Jesus did not want people to do. That's what the Pharisees were doing. So what does the New Testament say explicitly about our giving? Well, that brings us back to our text, 2 Corinthians 9, 6 to 15. And just see the emphasis on the heart in this text and the inner workings at play in our giving. So 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 7. We're not told explicitly or commanded explicitly to give 10% of our income in the New Testament, but here is what we are told explicitly. Each one must give as he has decided in his heart, his or her heart. So there's a freedom here. We are to think carefully, decide in our hearts, what is it I want to give? What can I give? And then we're to give that. What guides that decision process? Well, Paul speaks here of three things that should not characterize our giving, and then he speaks of three things that should characterize our giving. So according to 6, first, the three things that shouldn't characterize our giving. Verse 6, we should not give sparingly. Verse 7, we should not give reluctantly. 
or under compulsion, not to give sparingly, reluctantly, or under compulsion. Well, what does all that mean? Essentially, we're not to be stingy towards God. We're not to give in a begrudging manner where our true heart doesn't want to give, but we just feel we have to because we're Christians. You see, that kind of giving betrays a wrong view of God. It betrays this view of God that God is some demanding exactor of my money. There is so much wrong with that view of God and with that view of His money. Remember, all of your money is His money. You're the one given the responsibility to steward His resources. Absolutely. To provide for your needs and the need of your family. Yes. But so that you'll also, God gives so that you'll also have something to give. And remember, giving is proportionate. So the, the widow's might, two copper coins, and she, Jesus said, gave more than all the others. So our giving is proportionate. So we're not to give sparingly, reluctantly, or under compulsion. So see, with our building project, with our giving here at Great Vic to the general fund, we don't want any of it to be out of guilt. No sense of like, oh, they're really laying it on thick here. I better do something. That is the farthest thing that we want. Jesus said it is more blessed to give than receive. We want you to experience the blessing of a life of giving. So we shouldn't give in those ways. Well, what ways should we give? Well, again, in verses 6 and 7, we should not give sparingly, reluctantly, or under compulsion. We should give bountifully, intentionally, and cheerfully. And then the encouragement comes, for God loves a cheerful giver. That's wonderful. So we're to have a bountiful and cheerful heart. God has given me so much, we say, and so I delight to be able to give something back to fuel and fund His work in the world. Though it's not prescribed in the New Testament, you have to think, if the Old Testament standard was a tithe, a tenth, it's probably a good baseline to work towards in the New Covenant age. To work to get up to a tenth if you're not already there. And to move beyond it as you are enabled by the Lord. The promises attached to generous, cheerful giving in the Bible are just amazing. In Malachi 3, for example, a promise was given that as the people gave faithfully, God would bless them. Verse 10, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in the house and thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts. That's rare in Scripture. Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. I don't see this promise revoked anywhere in Scripture. In fact, in the New Testament, it seems that some of the promises attached to giving really flow from the heart of that text in Malachi 3. So 2 Corinthians 9, 11, God speaks of keeping providing for his people to fuel their generous giving. You will be enriched in every way to be generous in every way. Now, we want to be careful here. We're not prosperity preachers saying, you know, sow a seed and you will be blessed. Send your gift and I'll send you this promised locket that will heal all your sicknesses and all that. We're not saying that at all. But there clearly seems to be a pattern in Scripture. Give and it will be given unto you. And remember, all our giving is worship. These instructions, for example, don't just shape how you should give your money, but how you should give your time and your service to the Lord. So Sunday school teachers, crash leaders, tea coffee servers, deacons, it shouldn't be, oh no, I'm on lock up today. Oh no, I'm on crash. Oh. God loves a cheerful giver. 
fight that tendency. It might be there. That's normal. If you want to be sitting and you're tired and you're like, oh, I'm on the road again, or I won't get home to really late. Fight that temptation. Say, hang on. My giving today, whether it's service, crash, locking up, serving tea or coffee, my giving today is worship. It's worship for you deacons to stay late and lock the building for the church. It's worship. It's worship. Those people going out to the crash to look after the babies so that you can hear a sermon. It's worship. And our giving of all of our resources, whether it's time, money, or anything else, in the New Testament, the emphasis is continually what's going on internally in the heart of the giver. So let's get to the practical implications. Those are my three foundations. God is a great giver. The gospel is a gospel of giving. God's people are called consistently in the Old and New Testament to be gospel-shaped givers. So practical implications, just three in closing. Number one, giving should be part of your life. I hope it is. I really hope it is for the sake of you just enjoying the blessing that comes with giving. You reflect God in your giving. You reflect the gospel in your giving. Every time you give away money to the work of the Lord, you're demonstrating that money is not your ultimate security. Money is not your ultimate God. God is your ultimate security. God is your God. Giving away your money is an act of faith, a concrete act of service. It can be hard initially. It is a great check giving away money. It is a great check on the grip money can have in your life. It can be hard initially, but when you begin to give, it can be such a liberating joy. So that's implication number one. Giving should be part of your life of worship. Practical implication two. I believe that though the tithe is not commanded, it should be a good baseline for us all to work towards and to work beyond. If you doubt you can live off 90% of your income, let some of the wonderful promises of Scripture encourage you. God will bless and supply for your needs. Put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for your blessing until there is no more need. If the tenth, if 10% feels like too great a step, maybe start with a smaller percentage, 5%. Remember, no absolute command. Decide in your heart. And then with a heart that's cheerful and excited and wonderful that you have something you can give, what a blessing. You give. And when you give, you give to the Lord and you don't look behind you. You give it to the Lord. Those who steward it are responsible before God for stewarding it. You give to the Lord. You've done your bit. You do, of course, want everything to be stewarded well. That's why we have accountability. That's why, for example, we have a financial report this Wednesday at our members' meeting so that everything can be done in a transparent and accountable way. But whatever you do, your giving, your heart in your giving should reflect the manner of the gospel. Think about this. When God the Father gave Jesus to the world, in what manner was the Son given? What happened at the incarnation with the shepherds out in the hill when news broke of God coming into the world? Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those, peace among those with whom he is pleased. There was glory, there was rejoicing as the Father gave the Son. That's amazing. That's the manner we want our giving to take. I know it's hard in this day and age. We set up our standing order, we don't even think about it. But think about your standing order and say, Lord, thank you that that's worship. Or however you give to the Lord. Think first fruits. God gets the first portion of my salary. And I live on what's left. Third, what might this look like really, really practically? So giving should be part of your life. I believe the tithe should be what we are aiming for. If it's what the standard was in the Old Testament, certainly it should be so much as a baseline and more in the new. What might all this look like? Well, 
I believe the lion's share of your giving should go to your local church. And that's for some of you who are uber wealthy, that may be well, like crazy amount of money. And that's understandable. So you may decide to do something that's slightly differently. This is just now guidelines that come from, I think, the balance of Old and New Testament in Scripture. I think always tithing to the church of which you remember should take the lion's share of your giving. But then there is a hope that if you give your 10%, then maybe you could give another 3% to missions or something in the wider world, for example. At Great Vic, very practically, you could set up regular giving to our general fund that just looks after the general expenses of running the church here. You could set up a standing order of 30 pounds, 50 pounds, 100 pounds, 200 pounds. You could just work out 10%, there it is, I'm going to put that in. Or you might decide, I'm going to actually give 8% to the general fund and actually 2% of my income to the building fund. Target 100 is something we have set up now for our building fund. Looking for 100 people to sign up to give 50 pounds a month or more for a period of two years. Could you be one of the 100? There are already some of the hundred. Are you one of the hundred? Could you be? That would be a great way to be able to contribute, for example, to the building fund. If you're already tied up with lots of giving in lots of other places, maybe you could sacrifice something and set up that standing order. So there's lots of ways to give. The lion's share to your church, over above that to other things, missionaries, whatever you're committed to giving to. And I would encourage you, make some of your giving exciting. Giving by standing order is one thing, but find ways to bless others. It's a really exciting thing, for example, to if you know of a need, some families in need, you can just one night in the cover of dark have a hundred pounds in an envelope, unnamed, sneak up, post it through the door, pew, get away quickly. They'll never know who it was, and you get the thrill of giving. It's an exciting thing to give to the work of the Lord. Find ways to creatively and excite with an excited heart. Give. It's a great blessing. There's no other reason to do it. The world looks on and says, madness. You're a header. You're going to give away 10% of your income to that. What are you doing? And you just think of my children with the chocolate bar. It's all his. It's not my income. Yes, we work, we gain it, we work hard. But remember, who gives you the ability to work? Who's, who's kept you healthy? Who's given you the job? Who's given you the faculties? So this morning as you came in, there's an information sheet on your chair that gives you a whole outline of the information and the vision behind our building project. It also gives you information on how you could think about contributing to it. But I don't want this just to apply to our building project. I want to encourage each of us to be those generous, cheerful givers, now and on into the future. So think about it. How will you worship the Lord? How will you worship the Lord in your giving? Don't go out of here crawling with a sense of, oh, I feel really awkward because we're not giving anything. Or, oh boy, I just give 20 every now and again. I don't want anyone crawling. Don't be afraid. Face God. Go home. Pray. Lord, I'm sorry if I haven't been thinking rightly about this. Help me. Help me get over whatever it is that's holding me back from giving sacrificially and giving cheerfully. Help me, Lord. Remember, this is where it bites. Your faith starts to become concrete when it touches your bank account. Maybe your reluctance might say there's something that has too tight a grip on you. So think, how will you give in light of this message? How will you give if you're a member of this church to this church? Or if you're coming and thinking of settling and you want to contribute, how will you do that? Think, how will I give to the building fund? How will I give to missions, to other things out around the world? Remember 2 Corinthians 9 verse 7, each one gives as they have decided in their heart. That's where I get it's intentional. You don't just drift along. You think, you sit down as husband and wife, you look at your income, you work out your percentage, and you give it with joy. There's different seasons in life where you're enabled to give more, some seasons of life where you have to draw back in. That's okay. God does not want there to be a sense of compulsion, that's unhealthy, reluctant, sparing. He wants cheerful, generous 
bountiful giving in a manner that reflects the gospel. So, let's go back to where we started. Jesus said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Do you believe that? Let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to think of this important subject this morning. And thank you, Father, for the grace that there is in giving. No set law, no set directive that allows us to check out our hearts. But you go after the heart, and you want our hearts to be right, our view of you to be right. You're not a harsh exactor. You're a bountiful Father. And if we have that right view of you, that you will keep giving, keep providing, and that we cannot outgive you, Lord, I just pray that that would set us free so that in this area of our lives, we don't have to be embarrassed or ashamed, but with a clear conscience, we can say, yes, the giving that is part of my life is worship, and I'm so thankful for the opportunity and privilege of being able to be involved in the work of God in this way in the world. So, Lord, just guide us in our response, and we pray that you would continue to help our treasurer, Robert, as he uh, takes a lead in just stewarding those resources. We pray for Derek, who's taking a lead under Robert's authority and guidance with the building project finances. Just give them wisdom. I just pray for protection and wise stewarding of all the resources at Great Vic, and as each person responds to this message, and perhaps there's some interesting things to think about, oh, Lord, May our thoughts, may the meditations of our hearts in light of this be pleasing in your sight, our rock and our redeemer, in whose name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, we're going to stand together and respond by singing of the wonders of God's grace, that he would be our vision and that riches would not be our ultimate God. Let's stand and sing together.
May the Lord bless you and keep you and make his face to shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen.